I really appreciate the nice welcome. And I can already tell that there's been a very warm atmosphere in this conference that is online. And so I'm very excited just to be a part of everything that you're doing. Um, and just out of curiosity, because I'm pretty far away, I just wondered if anybody um, actually knows where George Mason University is. If you do, you can guess or put what you know in the chat box. Anybody know where it's located? <laughs> I see, not really. Aha, Virginia. Very good, Michael Lee. Okay, so it's located in Fairfax, Virginia, which is right outside of Washington, D.C. So I live near uh, the capital in the U.S. I actually live in Maryland, um, not in Virginia, but that's where I am now. It's very cold here now. We had a bit of snow, and so I don't quite mind being inside all day, every day at the moment. So today I would like to talk about this topic, the human touch. And you know, if you are like me, you have felt very isolated this past year because you can't really have that human touch, not in person. And when we're teaching our English learners, it's so important to have that human touch. And I just um, found this uh, photo, which is actually used in our world, uh, one of my book series. But one of the reasons why I chose this to start out this presentation is because I loved how it reminded me of having our students um, like on Zoom in boxes just like this. And even though you might be teaching remotely, it's good to think about your learners like this, right? They're in their individual boxes, but they are perhaps in their home, but they're in their own individual space. Okay, you see that each of the quilts here is colorful, but also unique to each learner. And one of the things that is so important when we're teaching remotely or teaching online is that we can actually get to know our students, see their uniqueness, feel that we are looking at them in a part of their world as we're teaching them. And that is gonna be so important, right? In order to have that human touch in online learning. And I just thought that this was such a great image to represent that. So how do we do it? Well, now, this past year, you could say, teaching has changed. It's now different. Now, even if you are back in the classroom, which a lot of us are not, but even if you go back to the classroom after having to go and teach online, now your teaching is probably different. We are blending more. We are trying to reach our learners in different ways now that we've been forced into using all this new technology. So we really have to think about, okay, teaching is different now because it's different and it's not what we're used to in terms of making those connections with learners. How can we add that human touch? I have another picture here which is of my, my own kids. And when they were doing the remote learning, I just thought, wow, this is so interesting to me because I, you can, like on the right side photo, you can see my son Finnegan or Finn. And he's of course interacting with this teacher by Zoom on the um, iPad. And you can look at it closely like this. What are the interactions happening there? But if you take a step back, right, and you go back and you see the whole scene, you also realize like kids are embedded in a whole other context, right? So you might see them in the little window, but they might be sitting in the kitchen. They might be sitting in another space. There might be dogs around them. They might have a sibling next to them. Maybe even someone's cooking in the kitchen. Maybe someone's watching a soccer game on TV. There's all kinds of things going on in the context. And so we have to think about in the window and then take a step back and realize there's a lot of challenges. So what we wanna do is also be very understanding of what is happening uh, in our video conferencing and in our students' worlds. 
So very important, of course, when we're creating that human touch. It isn't really about the technology, even though that's what's facilitating the communication, right? Now, here is um, Tech for COVID. They put all these free resources for teachers. And, and please feel free. They put them up there knowing that teachers needed some new resources. But I'm not going to talk about all of those. You can go explore them on your own. What I really want to talk about is not the technology, but everything else surrounding that and what we're using the technology for. Because the interactions we have, we need to make sure that we are, in order to teach students and have them, you know, be active in the learning, that behavioral part, we also have to make that connection to the emotional part. And if we do, then it'll make its way up to uh, their learning, which is that cognitive piece, right? So it's like our hands, hearts, and our head. All right, so I've got a few tips. Now, tip number one is to start with what you have. You know, you got to kind of look at what all your resources are, okay? So if you're teaching remotely and you're teaching from home, you might feel like, I don't have all those resources that I have in my classroom. What can I do? Well, you should think of it in a positive way and think, what treasures do I have where I am that I can use in my class? So, of course, step one is always to look at your lesson objectives. Then you can simply go room to room in your home and look for objects to support your lesson. Okay, don't forget closets, of course, right? If you're teaching um, something about job interviews, you can go and get a suit. I'm getting a suit out of my husband's closet, okay? Uh, going around, even in the hallways, you might go and find even treasures. So when I went around and I brought my laundry basket with me, I found this, right? An oldie but goodie, brown bear, brown bear. And I thought, oh yeah, I even forgot I had this on my bookshelf. I'm gonna use it in class. All right, so you start collecting your objects. Of course, if you have a unit on toys or animals, go look for toys in your kid's room. Actually, I was so excited that I found this bird, which is Fox, right, from Harry Potter. But I thought, oh, wait a minute. I just found brown bear, brown bear. Huh, I can use this in my class. All right, so just be creative and think, going around the room, going around your house, you might have extra items. Here I found a camel that I got on a trip when I was working with teachers in Libya. So, I, oh yeah, forgot about the camel. For a unit on food, look for items in the kitchen. There's tons of things. And remember that students can use what they have at home too. So for example, they can show and tell Ask them to show and tell about their favorite belongings. Okay, here, take a look at how simple it can be. Okay, now go to your room, go grab your favorite toy. All right, now tell us a little bit about your toy. Hi, I'm Elsa and I have Snowy Bell, my, my barn owl, my favorite toy. Let me tell you a little bit about barn owls. They can turn their heads 360 degrees and they hunt for mice in the dark. They have sharp claws or talons. We'll have to go feed her, bye. All right, so that's Ilsa, my daughter. So you can ask your students to do things related to less objectives, like you're learning about food. Okay, go grab one fruit, one vegetable, bring it, and then they have to show it. It could be their belongings. It could be anything that's important to them, something that you can have them share to get that human touch. Also pets, right? If you're like me, your pets have been a big part of your experience uh, in quarantine. But of course, you can't just put them in the laundry basket and it's hard to incorporate them into a lesson because they're hard to control for teaching, but you could think about using photos. You could actually make photos, take photos of pets and other things, or you can take a look at the photos you have. So if you're like me, you have hundreds of photos on your phone. So think about what kind of stories can you make with the photos that you have? Let's see, I'm gonna show you a story that I made using just photos I already had on my phone. 
and I'm going to tell it to you. All right. So this is the story of Sherlock. Once upon a time, there was a puppy named Sherlock. His mommy loved him very much. They worked together. They played together. Then one day, his mommy got married. Now he was part of a family. The children loved him and he loved the children. But one day, the family adopted another puppy. Her name was Penelope. Sherlock was not very excited about this new puppy. Penelope loved Sherlock, but Sherlock did not like the new puppy. She kept following him around. She took up all his space. <sighs> then, one day, Penelope wanted to play. Sherlock got angry. They fought and fought until Sherlock realized hmm, this was fun. And now they are best friends. And that is the story of Sherlock and Penelope. Okay, did you like my story? So of course, like I said, I already had all these photos and I just created a story to help teach my students. All right, so take a look at your photos and start to think about what stories can you create with photos you have to teach your students and go along with your lessons. Yeah, I am sure you can get a lot of stories out of the photos you have on your phone. All right, so thank you so much. I'm seeing in the chat box that there's a lot of good feedback and Sherlock and Penelope amazingly are pretty quiet right now, which is good during my presentation. All right, so tip number two is to be responsive. And this is so important, of course, because students, when they're working remotely or online, the worst feeling is if when you don't know what to do and you're confused, and then you can start to panic, right? That you're getting behind, that you're not where you're supposed to be. And so it's really important to always respond to questions and requests promptly. Usually when a student has emailed you, they are already like at this level of panic. <laughs> They're emailing you, you know, not down here. They're not calm. They're frantic that they're going to fail or not be able to submit something or that they don't know where they're supposed to be. So respond quickly. You can also have virtual office hours and maybe you do. How many of you actually do um, office hours that are virtually? You can use all types of video conferencing um, to be able to do it. And so the idea is to get that human touch to be able to go face to face with your students. Doodle is a great um, app to be able to schedule virtual office hours and to make appointments. Highly suggest doing that, especially if you have a lot of students and you have just a certain amount of time, you can schedule them more easily and quickly there instead of having like five emails back and forth between you and each student. All right, so of course, good feedback. You got to give them good feedback because they submit something and if they don't hear from you, it's very disconcerting. It makes students feel worried and uncomfortable if they don't know how they did, right? And so of course, good feedback is timely, friendly, and specific. And that's really important. It really isn't enough. And this is for any kind of class, no matter the delivery, that when you give your feedback to students, it should be, have some, hold some content, be specific, not just good job, good work, not enough to really promote the language learning. So 
one way to really push yourself to give that specific feedback is to use something like this, the feedback burger. How many of you like hamburgers? Uh, how many of you like hamburgers and also use a feedback burger? <laughs> All right, so a feedback burger just ensures that you are providing feedback in a way that is you know, specific as well as friendly. So the bun is, of course, kind of like relationship building, right? And then the cheese is specific praise about it. And then the meat, of course, um, is the meat of your feedback, which is something that might need some correction. Okay, and then lettuce, general praise for it. And then the bun is, of course, support at the end, maybe a little bit of praise. So it starts positive and ends positive. All right, so I want to give you also an example of giving feedback that's actually by using video feedback. And this I just recorded, by the way, it... Um, when I recorded it, I also was giving feedback about a student's video that they submitted as an assignment. Okay, and so let's take a look at the feedback, all right, of a video, but recording it for students. Here we go. Hold on. Hi, I'm Aaliyah and Christiana. I'm really excited to see the video you made for the Extreme Sports Camp Project. Let's watch it together. Great introduction. You're speaking nice and clearly. And I really like your choice of extreme sport. Highlining. I don't know very much about it. So I can't wait to learn some more. Here we go. People can do it all year round. In winter, in spring, in summer, or in autumn. Wow. Well, I'm thinking spring and summer and autumn might be great times to do highlining. I'm not so sure about winter. That seems a little bit too cold for me. Okay, let's keep going. Highlining is a very dangerous sport and only people with experience and many skills can do it. To do it, you need a mainland of webbing. Okay, it does look dangerous, and you definitely need to know what you're doing to go highlining. Now, I don't know what the webbing is or what arm steel rope is exactly, so it could be helpful in your video if you have an arrow pointing to each one when you read the list. Okay, let's keep going. Now, one joke. If you fall, the, the only way to survive is God. Very funny. Good ending. I loved it. You made a great video. So congratulations. I learned a lot about highlining and I can't wait to talk to you about it when I see you in class. I'm going to ask you about the webbing and the arm steel rope. All right, great job, bye-bye. All right, so I played the whole thing so you could really see. Um, oops. Sorry, give me one second. I did play the whole video so that you would be able to see all of the different parts of the uh, feedback. And so I just need to 
reset my presentation. So just give me one second. Okay, so did you find the video helpful? Is it something that you think you would be able to use with your students? All right, so you can't do it always for every single student if you have a lot of students, but what you can do is, let's say you collect projects, you have feedback, you can put up um, uh, some of the feedback that you see. Maybe there were some common mistakes. Maybe there were one or two that you wanna highlight. And so you could create a video just summarizing the feedback that you have for your students about a particular project. All right, now you can also have students give peer feedback. I always suggest doing PQP, similar to the uh, feedback burger, but it is helpful for them to see how they can give feedback. So peer feedback really doesn't work so well unless you are very specific about what you are expecting your students to give feedback on. So for example, so P, is praise. That's where you tell a classmate at least one thing that you liked about his or her piece. And then Q, question, and you ask your classmate a question about something you didn't understand in his or her piece. And then P, polish. You give your classmate one suggestion for polishing or making the piece even better. And by piece, it could be anything, writing, a project, a presentation, a poem, anything you're doing in class. All right, so here's an example. So this is Ilsa's uh, little writing about Snowy Bell that she presented. So you could say, P, I liked. Now notice you could give sentence stars. I liked, why did you, how about adding? And then students can fill it in. I liked your choice of animal. You had interesting details about barn owls. Q, why did you name your barn owl Snowy Bell? Good question. Do barn owls only eat mice? How about adding other things barn owls eat? So it's pretty simple, but it really is a great way to give peer feedback and to practice that type of assessment. Okay, um, another thing, allow students to provide feedback, right? Some, you see these all, all around. Well, I used to, when I used to go out, see that maybe at a restaurant or uh, at the airport, right? How was my experience <laughs> with an emoji? Always uh, allow students some opportunity to provide feedback. So for example, in your online platform, you could just have something called fixes and tips, right? It could just, the link could lead to a Google form or however you want to collect the information, but it could even be like they saw a typo on a page or maybe there was something that wasn't clear in the instructions, okay? Or maybe a page number was wrong <laughs> in the book that you asked them to read, whatever it is, fixes and tips. Okay, and then students can give you feedback and you can perfect your course. All right, tip number three is to personalize with videos. And of course, you saw an example of personalizing the feedback, which I use Loom to do. Um, but there are many other ways that you can uh, record like Screencast-O-Matic. Um, and I also wanna give you an example of Chatterpix, which is a, an app that I don't know if you're familiar with. Okay, so, um, you can personalize a video. So say, for example, this can be quick and I just use my, um, my iPhone to do it. Okay. I just recorded something. I wanted students to prepare a little bit for the next class. Okay. And so here's what this video is like. Okay. Hold on. Hi everyone. Let's get ready for next class. Look at this. This is a leaf. Repeat after me. This is a leaf. Oh, look at this. This is a leaf. I have one leaf. Now look here. These are leaves. Repeat after me. These are leaves. Oh, look out there. Those are leaves. Do you like my trees? 
Okay, so for next class, I want you to show me a leaf and some leaves. Now you can do it any way you want, with a picture, with leaves that are real, it's up to you. So I can't wait to see you next class. Bye-bye. All right, so giving those instructions in multiple ways. You might post text instructions, but a lot of times students uh, really connect with your videos and it doesn't have to be perfect either. And like I said, I just use my iPhone to do it. All right, now here's another way to really make things exciting with videos. Uh, anybody familiar with Chatterpix? Chatterpix, it's an app that students of any age and even grown-ups can use, right? And so what I'm gonna do is I'll show you a video with some examples of what Chatterpix can do. I, a frog, is a amphibian. It, got, it, it is covered with skin. A frog eats bugs. Frogs live in ground. I like that frogs can be poisonous. An iguana is a reptile. It is covered with scaly skin. An iguana eats plants. And iguanas live in hot places. I like iguanas. All right, so Chatterpix. Let me show you how to use it, okay? So it's an app that you can use and I will, here, I'll try to make it close here. So it's right here, okay? All right, very easy. You can use your photos or you can take a photo. Okay, so I'm just gonna take a photo of, um, I'm gonna take a photo of this frog, which was in that video, okay? All right. And here we go. Hold on one second. All right, so if you wanna go and try to download it, then you will also be able to follow along. So if you can try it out, let's try and do it together, all right? Okay. Sorry, I had to start again because it didn't work the first time. All right. Uh, sorry, Joanne. But, yeah. Um, I think a few of us are seeing, we, we don't see the screen, it's just black. Oh, okay. You see your presentation, but the screen inside is black. Oh, yeah, that's okay. Hold on one second. I'm going to show this right here, okay? All right. Okay, here we go. I'll show it to you. Don't worry. Give me one second. Technical difficulties, I shall say. Okay. So I'm going to, on Chatterpix, you can see here, I'm going to take a photo. And by the way, maybe I'll stop sharing so you can see me bigger. Okay. So I'm going to take a photo of this. Okay, so here you can see the frog. Now, I am going to put a mouth on the frog. Okay, and so when I do, it's going to make the frog talk. And then I just press record. Hi everyone, sorry for the technical difficulties. And then it'll play. Okay, so you can create anything. You can take a picture of your friend. You could take a picture of something in a book. You could take a picture of this and add language to it. All right, so I'm going to show you that you can even do it for older learners. So let's say you're learning about historical figures. You could take a picture of a historical figure and make the mouth move and talk. Now, does anybody know who this distinguished gentleman is? Any guesses? 
who he is or where he's from? Any ideas? Hmm. Uh huh. Confucius. Okay, that's a good guess. <laughs> Kung Fu Tao, China, China Emperor. Hmm. All right. Well, I made a chatter picks with this, and then you'll. All right. You will find out who he is. All right. Here we go. Hello. I am King Sejong. People call me Sejong the Great. I was the fourth king of the Chosun Dynasty of Korea. I became king in 1418 at the age of 21. I profoundly affected Korean history by creating Hangul, which is the phonetic writing system for the Korean language. I believe this is my greatest achievement for Korean people and culture. All right, so it's King Sejong from Korea, the most famous uh, king from Korea. So you can have students actually uh, take a picture of a historical figure, maybe Martin Luther King Jr. and recite a bit of the uh, I Have a Dream speech. So it's a way for them to be creative and to create things online. All right, have fun with chatter picks. Now, tip number four is all about creating a sense of community. And when you're working with students online, it is a pretty good idea to use routines. Now, this could be for young learners, but it could be for teenagers and even adults that students will feel more comfortable if when you are synchronous and with them, if you have routines to follow so that they feel comfortable knowing what they're supposed to do at each part of the lesson. Now, I always like to organize my lessons in this way, whether it's remote or in person. So I have my lesson plan. Okay, all of you are probably experts at developing lesson plans, but around the lesson is everything that I'm planning in terms of classroom management, okay, that goes around the lesson or even plans for things I'm gonna insert in the lesson. OK, so like you're going to take attendance, OK, do some sort of a greeting. And then, of course, very important to have attention getters and brain breaks. You might even do an exit ticket and then a farewell. So I'll give you some examples of these now. So routine, start each class with some routine to ask students how they are. OK, in this case, you can use a feel wheel, which I love because with students, they might use the same words every time you ask them, how are you? I'm fine, teacher. Or how are you? I'm good. <laughs> so it's really, really uh, a good activity also to expand their language learning and to be able to add new adjectives to their vocabulary. All right, so you could do a one word share. Okay, so let's say I feel happy. All right, and I will open this up a little more. Okay, so let's say I'm in the happy range. What about you guys? Okay, um, and so maybe I'm not just happy, I feel a little bit playful or perhaps a bit cheeky today. So this sort of feel wheel is something that can really be helpful to you in order to be able to start the day with your teen, have something that's fun and colorful, and also expand your students' vocabulary. All right. So uh, you can, if you do a one word share, you can also have students write the word down and then hold it up so that you can see how everybody feels using the word. You could also uh, have a one sentence share. Maybe everybody has to type in a complete sentence in the chat box. Um, or maybe they can share something that represents how they feel. So it's a great way to start class. All right. If you have very young learners, you can also start with the hello song. How many of you actually teach very young learners who are like in kindergarten or first grade? All right, so this song is to a very familiar tune, All right, So I'm going to sing it to you once and then we're gonna sing it together. So it goes like this. Hello, how are you? 
Hello, how are you? Hello, hello, how are you? I'm very good. Yeah, I'm very good. Yeah. Thank you very much and you. Okay, sing it with me. Okay, I'm assuming you're going to sing it with me. Here we go. Hello, how are you? Hello, how are you? Hello, hello, how are you? I'm very good. Yeah, I'm very good. Yeah. Thank you very much and you. Now you could do another version because maybe you ask your student, how are you? And you see one student looks tired. Well, then you could sing the song uh, related to how your student actually feels. So I will sing, hello, how are you? And it could go like this with the student. Hello, how are you? Hello, how are you? Hello, hello, how are you? I'm very tired, yawn. I'm very tired, yawn. Thank you very much and you. Oh, I guess my thank you very much and you wasn't very tired. Thank you very much and you. All right, so you can also check in with your students while doing a routine song like this. That's really fun for young learners. All right, hand signals. So when you're working synchronously with students, you might have videos on, but mute it, okay? So you need to manage the classroom well so that you know also if students do have a question. So if you have all the students on your screen, you can teach them um, to use these hand gestures as signals so that you can see if they have a question Okay, or maybe they have an answer. Okay, or maybe someone gives an answer and then they say, yes, me too, right? So when you see these, then you can tell what's happening with students. So even if only one student or two students are able to have their mic on and chat, you can actually um, keep that interaction going and know maybe who the next person to call on is. All right, so always plan attention getters, okay? Because if you are doing work online and you have students writing something or doing something, well, guess what? It's just like being in a classroom where they're not paying attention to you. They might have their headphones on, but they're not looking. And so you need to get their attention, right? So the same types of things, right? You can just like ring a bell. You could even blow the whistle, get their attention. You could even do the call and response. One, two, three, eyes on me. And then students have to look up into your video. One, two, eyes on you. Same thing, all right? Now, all learners sitting in front of a computer all day need brain breaks. To be honest, I need brain breaks because I find myself in Zoom meetings all day long. And so the beauty of remote learning where students are at home is maybe your classrooms are a little bit tight and don't have much room. Well, students might be the only one in the room online. They can actually stand up and, you know, shake their bodies and move it around and stretch. Okay, maybe you need them to just relax because they're getting stressed about the online learning. You're having to close their eyes. Okay, do a little bit of meditation. Oh, let's do this. Okay, everybody close your eyes and breathe in and let your breath out. Breathe in and let your breath out. Wow, how does that feel? I actually feel a little bit better right now. I got a little stressed when my chatter picks wasn't working. So that really calmed me down. All right, so you can also play soothing music for calming or have a one minute dance party, get students energized. If that's what you need to do, brain breaks. All right, now you might use exit tickets in your in-person classes. You can use them here too, right? First of all, it's a great assessment routine to so make sure you're meeting your objectives. You can use it at the end of class. So before students can click to exit, they have to do something to show that they understood what they learned in class. So it could be to submit a paper. Uh, as soon as you get that email, click, they can go. 
They have to answer one question about the story you told in the chat box. They look at a picture card and they have to say that, yes, it's a frog. All right, so then after you get the exit ticket, then you can log off. All right, so um, here's an example for a little bit older learners. And by the way, if students are at home, great idea to encourage extensive reading and have them read a book and then report on it. Now, you can use different ways to do this, okay? So um, when you give them a model and give them an example of what your book review looks like, they can actually, you know, if you have a WhatsApp group or any sort of mobile chatting group, you can create the group for your class and then they can post their writing and just record right in WhatsApp or Telegram or whatever you use, record and send the audio message, right? So here I posted the book review and then provided a model. This wonderful book is called Cliffhanger. It's by Jacqueline Wilson. In my opinion, she is one of the best writers in the world. All right, so that has them write and then do an audio recording. Now, by the way, I mentioned hand signals before, right? You can also teach a little bit of sign language. So you could do your own, but um, the American Sign Language, okay, this is an A. So go ahead and try it on your own. This is a B. This is a C, looks like a C. This is a D, looks like a D. And this is an E, it should look like an E. All right, so practice A, B, C, D, E. Now, hand signals, great. Why? Because you want to check comprehension of something or get some feedback, okay? So first I could get feedback. Did you enjoy the story of Sherlock? Okay, A, extremely, B, a lot, C, a little, D, not at all. Okay, and then you can get feedback from your students before they leave class. It could also be a comprehension check, right? So this is Sherlock, that's an S, and this is Penelope, that's a P. So who is bigger? Sherlock. Who is smaller? Penelope. Who is playful? Penelope. <laughs> Who's your favorite? Of course, I have Sherlock and Penelope both. Okay. Hand signals again for a comprehension check, exit ticket. All right, now you get to their farewell. And we are also getting to our farewell. And so at the end, to mark the end of class, you could do a little chant. Like, you were wonderful. You were great. See you next class, and don't be late. Say it with me once. You were wonderful. You were great. See you next class and don't be late. All right. So that last one, tip four, create a sense of community. You can do it with all these ways, right? The routines with the feel wheel, showing people on the video. It's all about the human touch, right? Because we can't get up here without hitting them here and finding ways to engage them here. All right. So one last thing. You might have noticed through all my examples, there is this element of showing myself, right? Don't just leave the picture with nothing there for your class, right? With the default. Show yourself, right? Maybe switch it up. There's a picture of me when I was a little girl outside, or there's Sherlock, or there's me and my husband traveling. So show a little bit of yourself. All of my examples showed a little bit of myself and my life to get that human touch, right? You, learned, you all learned a little bit about my family, a little bit about what my home looks like. Sometimes people don't wanna share things about their home and you can put on a background, but share something of yourself and who you are. And that is the only way to really get that human touch. So. Just to summarize, tip number one was to start with what you have. Use the resources you have and think positively all the time about what do I have, not what I don't have. And then be responsive. Make sure you always respond to learners in a timely way, but also give feedback that's friendly, but specific and helpful to them because they might feel like they don't know what's happening in that online environment. They wanna hear from you.
personalized with videos. I can't stress that enough, how much students feel more connected to you when they can see you and hear you talking, even if it's just a short video, or you just created something silly on Chatterpick, something that's going to help them to connect more to your instruction. And then finally, create a sense of community right? Routines are a good way to do it so students feel comfortable, but also, right, show yourself. So with that in mind, by the way, if you do use Facebook, I do have a Facebook group for teachers. It's called T-E-Y-L, and that's the link there. And I did want to mention, so I have this infographic there, and in the middle in red is purpose, okay? And I feel like this is so connected to what we do as teachers and as educators, right? Because you're a teacher, it's your job, right? It's your vocation, you get paid for it, not as much as you want or as much as we would like, but you get paid for it. It's your profession, right? You care about it, you're great at it. You're here because you want to do it better, right? That's because you love what you do and you have a passion for teaching. But most importantly, the world needs it. Right, and that is where we all feel a sense of mission and purpose. And that's why we're all here, I think, is because we are trying to help all of our children, teenagers, even adults learn and trying to help them to grow up to be better citizens of our world. So this is your sense of purpose. And I really hope that what I've shared with you today feeds into that purpose. And remember to try to get that human touch and reach out to your learners in all the ways that we talked about today. And that's it. Thank you very much for your attention.